In the summer of 1975, the beaches were empty. Everyone was inside sitting in movie theaters. Jaws would come to define the modern Hollywood blockbuster and be so imposing as to even shape people's relationship with sharks. The ubiquity of Jaws' influence is inescapable once you start looking for it. From the constant references in pop culture and the reappearance of its structure in so many horror movies, to the cultural icons it arguably made sharks into today. When I first saw Jaws, I completely underestimated how scared I would be. I mean, this movie came up when my mom was a kid. There's no way it could hold up nearly 35 years later, but of course it did. Still, I got to experience this fear privately. This was not the case in 1975. Kind of been uneasy and keep turning around and looking <laughs> to see what's behind me as well as in front. In this video, I'm going to talk about how Jaws changed the world. I want to start with looking at its impact and what led to the movie being made in the first place. Then, how they made it, and finally, its lasting legacy up to today. So with that, let's get started. Then why don't we have one more drink and go down and cut that shark open. 59 years before the release of Jaws, a series of shark attacks occurred along the coast of New Jersey. Four people were killed and one left injured in July of 1916. These events would be the inspiration for American author Peter Benchley's 1974 novel Jaws, from which the film would be adapted the year after. Up until 1916, it was assumed sharks would not attack people on the Jersey Shore unless provoked. When this was found to be untrue, panic spread quickly. The area was full of tourists at the time, and what had been thought of as harmless animals were now feared as vicious monsters. People's opinion of sharks would change drastically at this time. Five attacks in 12 days is a lot. But to me, the attacks of 1916 feel so alien now, more than 100 years later. Having grown up with Jaws and the media it inspired having long been a part of pop culture, shark attacks just feel like something that happens in movies. These animals are not the great powerful monsters that some people have made them out to be over the years. Uh, who, I don't know who did it, but he should deserve the speaking to. And so my experience with Jaws for the first time was so different than it would have been in 1975. And it still managed to scare the crap out of me. So I wanted to talk to someone who saw it when it came out. So, as all good YouTubers do, I called my mom. Now, my mom was only 11 when Jaws came out. But this, of course, didn't stop her friend's mom from dropping them off at the movie theater alone to go see an already famously scary movie. She told me that her and her friend Elizabeth ended up staying through the whole movie, but they did watch it with their shirts pulled over their heads. So after getting picked up by her friend's mom again after the movie, it was time to go to the cottage for two weeks. And for the entirety of these two weeks, not once did my mom go in the water. I'd like to also point out that this was not a cottage on the coast of the ocean or anything. This was on Lake Meskwabi, an inland lake in southern Ontario, Canada. And I can assure you, there are no great whites, or any sharks for that matter, lurking in the lakes of Halliburton County. But I'd like to see you convince a terrified 11-year-old that she's fine to go swimming after just seeing Jaws. It's not hard to find people with stories like this about the release of Jaws. Everybody saw this movie when it came out. It was the highest grossing film at the time, and it actually ended up solidifying summer as blockbuster season. Before then, winter was prime release time for movies. Jaws completely exploded and became more than could have been predicted. The novel that it was based on was a huge success in its own right, but the movie needed to change so much of the story to become what it is. The novel's author, Peter Benchley, wrote the original screenplay, but other writers were brought in after Benchley said, I'm written out of this, and that's the best I can do. Nearly all the subplots of the novel were dropped, characters were changed significantly, and by the time the movie was finished, what it had in common with the novel seems to be a few names and a shark. The movie of course seems to have benefited from these changes, as it became a rubric for the horror genre. A what? The shark in Jaws isn't actually on screen all that much for the first half of the movie. In the opening attack sequence, you don't actually see the shark at all. We see the thrashing of the victim on the water's surface, as well as a shark's point of view shot, but no actual shots of the shark itself. 17 minutes in, we finally see a couple fins and a lot of blood, but the shot is pretty wide and only lasts for a couple of seconds. The third attack, there is, again, just no shark footage, and only an hour in do you actually get a good look at more than a fin of the Great White. 
The effect this gave Jaws was noted by many filmmakers who would follow. We see this structure pop up all over the place these days. And for good reason. Jaws is an exemplar of suspense. But in its sequel, Jaws 2, you see the full shark 20 minutes in. And there's not a whole lot of tension to it either. Where in the opening sequence of the first movie, there's still a lot of mystery around it. In the second movie, there's just a shark all of a sudden, and it doesn't really feel earned. The thing that made the first movie work so well was that it was about build-up, not the payoff. Not showing your big bad evil monster is almost a trope among horror movies, especially creature features. Movies like Tremors, aka Jaws on Land, Alien, and a lot of J.J. Abrams' work, like Super 8 and Cloverfield, hold off on showing you the whole monster. This idea can effectively build suspense and payoff, but I find that sometimes it's used just to keep you around till the end. The reason this works so well in Jaws is that until you see the fin cutting through the surface, the threat of the shark exists everywhere in the water. So whenever there's water, there might be the shark. We see this in movies like Alien, which openly takes inspiration from Jaws. In Alien, the layout of the ship allows the xenomorph to get around in secret using the ship's vents. The xenomorph uses the unlit crevices of the ship, much like the opaque waters in Jaws. Similarly, the sandworms and tremors travel beneath the ground, and so can't be seen until they strike. The effect falls flat though when your monster doesn't look good. If your big reveal looks stupid, all the tension you've built up until that point is completely undone. But when you finally get a look at the shark, about an hour into Jaws, nearly halfway through the runtime, it looks like a giant, terrifying man-eater of a shark. There are plenty of obvious and outright callbacks and references to Jaws and media, but I think this Hitchcock-style don't-show-the-monster idea is a more subtle part of Jaws that can be seen in so much that followed. The thing about it, though, is that it wasn't the original direction. This was supposed to be an in-your-face, look-at-this-crazy-monster action horror, not a tense, thrilling nail-biter. The decision to show so little came as a necessary reaction to the animatronic sharks taking on water and malfunctioning so often. Well, the first mistake with the shark was they made a big mistake and they built it for fresh water. What's the difference? Well, electrolysis is a major problem when you get salt into all the machinery, into, into oh, the, the electrical system. Yeah. The technical faults of the animatronic shark weren't the only thing to plague the production. But looking back now with the movie as the staple that it is, clearly everything worked out. And so many of the problems that the production faced seem to have shaped its success in the end. It does look like it was a frustrating project to be a part of, though. Action. Gun doesn't fire. Cut. Set Gun doesn't work. Cut. Cut! From very early on, the production suffered setbacks. When looking into this, though, it honestly looks like everybody had a point where they didn't want to make this movie. I heard a conversation that went something like this. We're going to have to have this giant shark come out of the water and land on a boat and crack the boat in half. And I remember saying to my agent, as we walked away, I said, those guys, are, they gotta be kidding. They gotta be kidding. A giant shark that cracks a boat in half? I thought they were loony. Steven Spielberg, 26 at the time, nearly left the project fearing that he'd gain a reputation as somebody who just makes explosion movies. And I read it and I suddenly said to myself, wow, this is just like a movie I just made about a truck and a hapless driver called Duel. Looks like he had nothing to worry about, though. That's definitely not how I'd peg him now. Richard Dreyfuss, who played Hooper, turned his role down at first, but would later change his mind. And Robert Shaw initially wasn't interested in playing Quint because he didn't like the book. It's incredible to think how much doubt went into this thing, knowing how well it turned out. And it's incredible how well it turned out, considering how much went wrong. The crew ended up giving the movie the nickname Flaws after so many setbacks, particularly problems due to filming on the ocean. Another film first from Jaws. This is my second day at sea, and I have 54 more days to go. All I can tell you is uh, it's, it's twice as slow shooting at sea as it is shooting on land. Those shots with the orca on the vast, endless ocean were so amazing to me. Having the characters surrounded by the water on all sides while the shark could be anywhere is just so stressful. And for the crew, it was so much worse. The weather was unpredictable, and heavy waves meant useless shots of bobbing nonsense. Sailboats would pass into frame because they couldn't really block off an area, completely destroying the illusion that they were far out at sea. 
In reality, most of the movie was filmed on location in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, where the water doesn't drop more than 11 meters, or 35 feet. Some shots did include a real shark, like the cage scene filmed in Australia, but that also didn't go very well. Here's an interesting example. When we were shooting the Australian sequences of the great white sharks, one of the great white sharks jumped into the cage boat and sank the cage boat and sank the cages, grabbed and twisted a cage and then sounded with the cage. And when we recovered the cage, it was torn up, completely torn up. Much of the film gear wasn't made to be used at sea, and replacing broken stuff meant heading all the way back to shore. People were getting seasick all the time, so yeah, maybe not everything was a blessing in disguise. Some stuff was just cursed. But they did it. They finished the movie, a hundred days over schedule for shooting, but they got all that they needed. Filming was chaos, and post-production really needed to swoop in and save the day here. Something that saved Jaws was the editing. Verna Fields was the editor for Jaws, and would end up winning an Academy Award, among other accolades for the film. Her work on this movie is probably the most studied film editing maybe ever, and for good reason. Fields was the key to make the shark look, well, like it wasn't broken all the time. Fields was the one whose job it was to hide all of the stuff that went wrong during filming, as well as the one who kind of ended up giving the shark its personality. I always found that the shark felt more like a character than just a force of nature. It's intelligent, it's careful, and it mocks the characters. This personality wouldn't have come across with a shark that's always on screen just chomping away at stuff. The necessity of hiding the shark transformed its role into a stalking villain instead of a big dumb fish having lunch. But maybe the final piece of the puzzle in turning Jaws into the gripping thrill ride it wasn't supposed to be is John Williams' score. It would be hard to argue that this is not one of the most iconic film scores ever. Particularly that one part. Yeah, you know the part. Dun, 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 dun. And at first I began to laugh. I thought he was, he had a great sense of humor. He was putting me on. John Williams is one of the biggest composers in film. You might recognize some of his stuff. Uh, you know, Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter. Pretty much any movie soundtrack that you can hum on demand, that was him. Here's him talking about the iconic Jaws theme in 2014 at the Academy event Behind the Score, The Art of the Film Composer. But in the repeated bass note to try to uh, create something that was an unstoppable force, the power of the shark, those two notes will keep coming at you. They maybe get very soft at a certain point if he's far away, but then they get very loud if he comes close to you. So it, it is a very... Uh, basic and fundamental musical element to try to ignite primordial fear of being eaten in the depths, if you like. Williams had worked on Spielberg's first movie, The Sugarland Express, and was a shoe in for Jaws. The theme from Jaws, specifically those two notes, ramping and speed, is perhaps the most referenced part of the movie. It has become not just the theme of Jaws, but kind of the default sound for fear and tension. The thing that sticks out to me about this theme is that it generally plays before you see the shark. It's not the sound of a shark attack, but of the shark approaching. That's the bit people remember. Not the payoff, but the build. They even use the theme when there is no attack to trick you into think one's going to happen. Someone's swimming in the water and the music starts, so of course I assume this person's getting eaten, but no. And maybe a fake out seems silly to you, or maybe I'm a fool for falling for it, sure. But it got me good and I enjoyed it. I was on the edge of my seat because I saw somebody in the water and I heard two notes. I think that goes to show how much this movie can get in your head, or at least my head. The movie plays with the viewer just like the shark plays with its prey, taunting them while it circles. Williams is a masterful composer and a master of telling stories with music. So much of the characterization of Jaws' villain came from Williams and Fields because facial expressions and body language just don't exist for animal characters. I think the ubiquity of the theme from Jaws as a sign for fear speaks well to the effect of Jaws' influence overall in pop culture. So much of John Williams' IMDb page is writer theme from Jaws on stuff that isn't Jaws because people just reference it that often. 
Seriously, I tried to count them all, and I got to 20 and realized I hadn't made it as far back as 2010 yet, so I gave up. If somebody wants to count it and drop that in the comments, very much appreciated. Jaws's mark can be seen everywhere, expectedly in heavily referential TV shows like The Simpsons and Rick and Morty, as well as direct homage in Jaws-like movies like Piranha 3D, Deep Blue Sea, Sharknado, and Great White, which actually lost a lawsuit to Universal Pictures over being too similar to Jaws. People have tried to rip off this movie so many times, and with varying degrees of subtlety. But more people go about their tribute to Jaws more civilly, quoting the theme, like here in Clerks, or a few famous lines like, I can do anything I want, I'm the chief of police, or we're gonna need a bigger boat, oh, we're gonna need a bigger restaurant. or the line, that's some bad hat, Harry, which actually has a production company named after it. The legacy of Jaws is living strong even decades later in pop culture. But another realm I believe Jaws has had just as powerful an impact on is our relationship to sharks. As I talked about earlier, Jaws really set off a widespread fear of sharks for a lot of people. But I think its effect has actually changed. The shark in Jaws was undeniably the villain. But decades later, I think it also made the shark a celebrity, a movie star. And people care about movie stars. They care about their lives off screen, and although this shark off screen is a bucket of bolts, people gained a deep interest in these fish. Despite the fact that people seem to endlessly be able to make shark attack movies like The Meg, media that highlights the preservation and misunderstood nature of sharks is undeniably popular as well. With programs like the Discovery Channel's Shark Week, which runs annually and was notably hosted by Jaws author Peter Benchley in 1994, People are aware and invested in sharks more than a lot of other animals. Rhinos don't get the same attention. They're endangered too, but there hasn't been a really cool rhino attack movie, so screw them, I guess? I, I don't know. Let's face it, sharks are just awesome. The dangerous reputation that they have is a selling point on why to care about them. It's cool, and I think that the role that Jaws played in shaping people's view is undeniable. Jaws definitely had me and a lot of others terrified of sharks for a good while after the first viewing. But I know that, at least for me, Jaws also got me interested in learning more about sharks. It got me curious. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to meet one, but I definitely thought, that's really scary, but also extremely cool. Jaws had this effect on a lot of people, and I think it's interesting, if not a bit grim, to think about where sharks might be today if it wasn't for this movie. Would they have gone extinct already without the special attention they've gotten? I don't know. I can't really say that I'm sure they would have. But still, it is strange to think about how a movie about sharks eating people off the coast of New England could have had a part to play in wildlife conservation efforts decades later. It is absolutely crazy what circumstances and mishaps led to Jaws being the movie that it is. One of the most famous and lasting movies ever got so many of its traits by accident or to cover up mistakes. The production was chaotic and tedious, but what we got managed to completely reshape the art form and the industry surrounding it, while simultaneously turning sharks into a kind of celebrity. Look, I know it's not a hot take to say I love this movie. It often gets the credit it deserves, but I don't know if you can make Jaws completely on purpose. As studied as it is, I think what makes Jaws so amazing is how the creators adapted to the situation, not the plan they had going in. They made three sequels to Jaws. None of them did as well, and none of them are as good. In fact, the last one they made is often cited as one of the worst movies ever made. There are so many Jaws knockoffs, it is stupid. Maybe they're all just trying to cash in on something that worked, I don't know. Maybe they didn't try. But you couldn't beat Jaws, even if you did. No one has. I'd be surprised if someone ever did. So finally, reference Jaws, pay homage, show that you love it, but don't try and do Jaws. It can't be done. I mean, even the people that made Jaws barely meant to make it this way. Fire, you son of a <laughs> Hey 
Hey, this is Tobias. That's gonna be the end of this video. So thank you for sticking around until the end. Let me know in the comments if you've got another movie you think just changed the world like this, or if you have a good story about seeing Jaws for the first time. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, and if you wanna see more great stuff, subscribe to Screen Rant. All right, thanks, and I'll catch you next time.